السلام علیکم اینڈ تھینک یو سو مچ فار ٹیوننگ ان ٹو کوشر مسلمان وی آر بیک آفٹر لانگ ٹائم اینڈ ود اس ان کانورسیشن ٹوڈے از ڈاکٹر حفصہ کنجوا اینڈ وی وڈ بی ٹاکنگ ٹو ہر اباؤٹ ہر ریسنٹ بک دیٹ کیم آؤٹ کال کالنائزنگ کشمیر اسٹیٹ بلڈنگ انڈر انڈین آکیوپیشن ڈاکٹر افسا کنجوال از این اسسٹنٹ پروفیسر آف ساؤتھ ایشین ہسٹری ان دا ڈپارٹمنٹ آف ہسٹری ایٹ لافا ایٹ کالج ان پینسلوینیا ویئر شی ٹیچز کورسز آن دا ہسٹری آف دا ماڈرن ورلڈ ساؤتھ ایشین ہسٹری اینڈ اسلام ان دا ماڈرن ورلڈ ان ہر ورک کالنائزنگ کشمیر شی ایگزامنس ہاؤ دا انڈین اینڈ کشمیر گورمنٹس یوٹیلائزڈ اسٹیٹ بلڈنگ نارملائزیشن پروسیسز اینڈ ڈیولپمنٹ ٹو انٹرینچ انڈیاز کالونیل آکیوپیشن آف کشمیر ان دی آفٹر میتھ آف پارٹیشن If you want to access the archives that she makes use of in her work and to follow other updates about her book you can follow the Instagram handle at colonizing kashmir So thank you Dr. Afsa for joining us today to talk about your book So to begin with we would like you to introduce the book to us so There are books that have been written on Kashmir, about Kashmir, by Kashmiris before. So, what are some of the popular or dominant or taken for granted notions about Kashmir's politics that the book tries to challenge or subvert? Um, in short, if I may ask, what does the book try to do exactly? What are the kinds of interventions that the book is trying to make? If you could tell us that. Sure. Uh, first, I wanted to start with uh, thanking you for having me on this podcast. This is the first podcast I'm doing on the book, um, and I'm very honored. And it's also really fitting that, the, um, that it's with the Kosher Musulman podcast. So basically, the book looks at the 10-year period of rule that Bakshi Gulam Muhammad was in power in Kashmir as the prime minister. So the year is 1953 to 1963. And it examines how he came to power after leading a coup against Sheikh Abdullah, his, uh, his predecessor, and also how his time in power basically entrenched India's colonial occupation in Kashmir. And each of the different chapters in the book look at the ways in which India's occupation operated through Bakshi's state building practices, and specifically through things like international diplomacy, film, tourism, education, economic development, and cultural reform. So I was interested in this period, 50s and the 60s, because when I began my research, my PhD research, um, the scholarship on Kashmir, um, much of it was written by Indian academics, as I'm sure you're aware. And they, of course, wear their nationalism on their sleeve. Um, and much of their research either centered around promoting the Indian perspective of partition Um, and then subsequently, the period after the late 1980s, when the armed rebellion and uh, mass popular uprising began. And in the past decade or so, there has been an emerging body of work in the field of critical Kashmir studies. This is scholarship that sees itself as the occupation that has challenged some of these Indian nationalist frameworks. So, for example, um, these scholars have looked at the significance of the Poonch Rebellion and the Jammu Massacre and how it helps us rethink 1947 in Kashmir. Or they've looked at the different ways in which the military occupation, um, especially through anthropology, has operated in Kashmir since the late 1980s. But I found that there was still very little critical scholarship that helped us understand what happened in those decades in between partition and the late 1980s. And the Indian academics, most of them who were political scientists who did work on that period, um, if they didn't blame Pakistan, uh, they basically opined that it was either the failure of Indian secularism or the failure of Indian democracy or the failure of economic development that led to what they called a, quote, secessionist struggle. Um, but my own archival work in the 1950s and 1960s actually revealed something different, that it was precisely through these different modalities of control that relied on discourses of development, secularism, and democracy that India was able to entrench its uh, colonial rule in Kashmir. And so I tried to historicize India's occupation and show that it may have looked different in this time period in comparison to what um, we may be more familiar with in the late 1980s with the brutal militarization. But it was still very much involved in suppressing Kashmiri demands for self-determination and sovereignty. And so my book basically tries to contribute to broader studies of settler colonialism, colonialism, 
colonialism, and occupation. Primarily, it challenges the idea that India is a post-colonial state. Rather, it argues that it's a colonial one. Um, but it also shows how discourses of normalcy, democracy, secularism, and development actually serve as instruments of colonial domination and produce their own subversions. And then finally, I hope that um, my hope was that this book will not just be useful to helping us understand Kashmir, but also many other regions that are like Kashmir. And when I started the book, I thought in some way, or when I started my work, I thought Kashmir was this very unique space. And, you know, there was the kinds of things that are happening there don't happen in other places. Um, but actually through my own research and reading, um, I realized that there are a lot of places like Kashmir um, because in many ways, modern day borders don't actually adhere to people's understanding of place and history. And so I'm hoping it helps people understand how modern nation states use these different modalities of control to establish uh, their rule in these places where they lack legitimacy. Thank you for that uh, concise summary. I would like to build on that, uh, if I may. So right in the introduction uh, of your book, you quote Nehru once, where he's talking about Kashmiris, and he says, and I quote, they are soft and addicted to easy living. The common people are primarily interested in a few things, an honest administration, and cheap and adequate food. If they get this, then they are more or less content. So what Nehru says here about Kashmiris, we see that this view of Kashmiris has persisted. And we see this even today where Kashmir's problem is narrated in terms of a lack of what is called development or a lack of what is called good governance or the presence of corruption. So the presupposition is that if India treats Kashmiris right, all will be well uh, in Kashmir. So development itself is not seen as a modality of colonial violence. Uh, it's not seen as one way in which colonial power manifests in Kashmir. So the struggle for liberation is imagined in this scheme as stemming from a feeling of grievance or disappointment or discontent or alienation as it's called sometimes which is seen as an outcome of a lack of development. So the idea goes that the solution to the problem in Kashmir is more development, is better development, is good governance. So how does your book critique this understanding of development? How does it locate development in colonial power in Kashmir, Indian colonial power in Kashmir? So what does your book say about this? Yeah, what's interesting about what you said is that for so long, Indian writers have kept writing the same article where they keep saying Kashmiris are getting alienated, Kashmiris are getting alienated. Um, and you never see the part, you know, it's like when were they actually never alienated? So what does that term alienation actually even mean? Um, but basically, part of what I argue is that in these early years of India's colonial rule over Kashmir, um, both the Indian government and client regimes like Bakshi's Saw the Kashmiri or saw the Kashmir issue not in terms uh, political terms, meaning not a question of sovereignty or self determination, but rather in economic terms linked to a better standard of living. So Kashmiris were depicted as being malleable; that even though they may have varying political aspirations, they had the potential to be integrated subjects um, as long as they basically saw the benefits of uh, being under India. So state planning then played a really important role in managing. Uh, Kashmiri's aspirations. And they attempted to show Kashmiris the many benefits that they could incur under India, well beyond what was possible under any other political setup, namely in this time uh, being part of Pakistan, but also well beyond what was provided to Indian states. Um, but what's interesting is that this simply did not work because obviously the issue is not economic, it is political. So take the issue that you mentioned of corruption, for example. So the government utilized corruption for its own ends, basically to enable a collaborator class that could be subservient to Indian rule. Um, so it's not that India or its client regimes bemoaned that corruption existed and that because it exists, it meant that Kashmiris were disillusioned with India. Um, it's actually precisely because of corruption that India was holding on to Kashmir in the first place. Um, and that's similarly what was happening with, um, with development and so on. That's true. And if I could ask you another question based on this discussion that we are having right now, uh, 
So in your book, you talk about the colonial politics of life that the Indian state has done in Kashmir, where colonial power was defined not so much by the manifest of brutal violence, but through the processes of normalization. It was defined not through dispossession, but through the encouragement of consumption, the impulse to consume, which then was fulfilled by the Indian state. It was defined not through the act of taking, but through the act of giving and providing. So you talk about this relationship of dependence of Kashmir on India that the Indian state actively fostered. Talk to us about it. Yeah, so um, this is linked, of course, to the last question about how the Indian state and the Kashmir state perceived Kashmiri relations. And I would say the politics of life is probably the most significant intervention the book tries to make in terms of understanding Kashmir at this time, um, but also in trying to understand or sift through different types of control that exist in colonial contexts. Um, and I bor borrow the term from the scholar Nev Gordon, who uh, uses it similarly actually to describe Israel's occupation in the West Bank after the 1967 war. And it basically refers to how the Indian government and Kashmir's client regimes uh, propagated development, empowerment, and progress to secure the well-being of their population and to normalize the occupation for multiple audiences. And this meant uh, foregrounding day-to-day -day concerns of employment, food, education, and provision of basic services. And at, at the same time, it meant suppressing questions of self-determination and Kashmir's uh, political future. So you may have heard this, um, that once Nehru is purported to have uh, told Sheikh Abdullah that Kashmir in gold, golden chains. Um, and I think that quote really adequately re represents like what the politics of life was about. Um, and the government was hoping that to, uh, with an improved standard of living, greater prosperity, Kashmiri Muslim sentiments would shift in favor of India towards a form of emotional integration. Now, the reason why, as you mentioned, that the politics of life is important is that when we look at settler colonial contexts, the common understanding or the image that we have of these places is of immense dispossession, violence, war, and marginalization. And of course, many times they are, and that's also been the predominant story in Kashmir for decades too. Um, but then only seeing colonialism as being defined by manifest violence actually obscures our other our understandings of the other types of ways that it can operate through giving development and empowerment. And this is what defined the early decades of Indian rule in Kashmir. And this is what I think also created these kinds of split subjectivities amongst Kashmiris, which I talk a little bit about my um, in my uh, conclusion chapter, where in many ways, you know, many people are kind of taking part in their own subjugation um, because of their desire for empowerment or economic development and so on. Um, the other point that I would make is that when uh, scholars of settler colonialism talk about elimination, um, they don't just mean, you know, elimination of the native population and so on. It's not just that the native population is uh, like eliminated physically or they're just killed off. Um, that of course happens as well, but the elimination can also occur by assimilation um, or what I call integration in this book, where basically the idea is to rid the people of their own sense of history and identity um, and bring them into line with the colonial state. That's actually quite interesting. And obviously to this colonial politics of life that the Indian state does in Kashmir, we simply say that we contest India's power when it allows us to live as much as we contest its power when it kills us. So the point is that it should bear no power upon our lives. It should not bear the power to give. It should not bear the power to take. And if a person occupies our home, it would be absurd to shift the primary focus from expelling the intruder to the question of whether or not the intruder lets us sleep and eat at our home. It would be even more absurd if we start thinking of the permission to do so as an act of generosity. So the Indian state in Kashmir is a colonizer. Even if it were to let us eat lavishly and sleep comfortably at our home, the main problem still remains. What the hell are you doing at our home? Why do you wield the power to let us sleep or not sleep? To let us eat or not eat? So this discussion about the varying forms, uh, varying manifestations that the colonial power can take actually reminds me of this book called Psychopolitics, 
by Byung Chul Han. And the second chapter in the book is called Smart Power, and it's very interesting that chapter. And I would actually like to read some lines from this chapter. So Byung Chul Han talks about how power commands highly different modes of appearance, and its most direct and immediate form finds expression as the negation of freedom. This enables power holders to impose their will against the will of those subject to power by violence, if need be. However, power is not limited to this violence. It's not limited to breaking down resistance and forcing obedience. It need not take the form of coercion. And this is something that we do think that colonial power is always coercive. Byung Chul Han says that power that relies on violence does not represent power of the highest order. The mere fact that another will manages to form and turn against the power holder attests to the latter's weakness. Wherever power does not come into view at all, wherever it's invisible, it exists without question. The greater power is, the more efficient it is, and the more quietly it works. It just happens. It has no need to draw attention to itself. And then he says that power can express itself as violence or repression, as it has in Kashmir. But it does not necessarily have to. It's not necessarily based on force. Power need not exclude, prohibit, or censor. Power can be permissive. Nor does power necessarily stand opposed to freedom. Indeed, power can even use freedom to its own ends. And then, Byung Chul Han says that when he speaks about smart power, it's the kind of power that does not operate by means of forbidding and depriving, but by pleasing and fulfilling. Instead of making people compliant, what smart colonial power tries to do, it seeks to make them dependent. So power that is smart and friend friendly does not operate frontally, against the will of those who are subject to it. Instead, it guides their will to its own benefit. It says yes more often than no. It operates seductively, not repressively. It seeks to call forth positive emotions and exploit them. It leads astray instead of erecting obstacles. Instead of standing opposed to the subject completely, smart colonial power meets the subject halfway. And we see a good example of this idea of smart colonial power meeting the subject halfway in the recent Moharram procession that took place. So the Moharram procession was allowed by the colonizing state. Not only was it allowed, but some colonial administrators participated in it very actively and embraced it and popularized it. But only after the participants of the procession had fulfilled and accepted certain conditions was the procession allowed to take place when they had accepted that they would not raise pro-Azadi or pro-liberation slogans and they had accepted that they would not raise the pictures or take the names of pro-freedom armed fighters were they allowed to carry out this procession. So here is a good example of how colonial power, when it's smart, tries to meet the subject halfway. So instead of denying the procession outright, what the colonizing state did was that it met the subjects halfway. So moving on, uh, one of the key takeaways for me when I was um, engaging with your work was your critique of secularism in the context of Kashmir. And this was very really refreshing because most of the works that come out um, on Kashmir, even the ones that are written by Kashmiris themselves, do suffer from this unquestioning adherence to secular normativity. And this was something that you challenge very well in your work. So we do see, even to this date, that the problem in Kashmir is oftentimes narrated as stemming from a lack of secularism or Indian secularism's failure to live up to its ideals. So it is assumed that there is some inherent contradiction between secular power and colonialism, as if a colonial power cannot be secular, and if it is secular, it cannot be colonial. Hence, we oftentimes hear calls for more secularism or a return to Nehruvian secularism. So in this schema, secularism is seen as a solution to the problem in Kashmir. 
But in your work, you argue that secularism was part of India's colonial episteme in Kashmir, and the category of secular was deployed to justify India's occupation of Kashmir and criminalize the aspirations of pro-Azadi Kashmiri Muslims. So, what does your book tell us about this imbrication, this entanglement of secular power with coloniality in the context of Kashmir, and how does it compel us to rethink? some of our presuppositions about secularism. So, especially given the rise of Hindu nationalism and the Modi government in India today, you often hear about the need, especially by Indian liberals, um, to return to India's secular ideals. Um, but then what does it mean when you use the term secular for India? I don't think we really, or people have really tried to understand or contend with that. Um, so Indian leaders like Nehru basically say that India's secular ideals are exemplified through its only, quote, Muslim majority state, meaning Jammu and Kashmir. Um, but then what does that mean if India's secularism or its secular credentials are grounded in the context of a colonial occupation? Um, so that that is kind of the, the big question. And then in terms of producing a good Kashmiri secular subject, um, it was basically a mechanism both by the Indian government and the Kashmir government um, to entrench India's colonial occupation and also criminalize Muslim political aspirations or alternate um, visions of nationhood and belonging. And so Kashmiri Muslims were politically useful for India's secular politics of inclusion but again, when you think about this term inclusion um, and what I mentioned earlier about assimilation and integration and how um, those are also part of secular uh, settler colonial narratives, because what it means is that they erase um, the, the native people or the uh, indigenous communities own sense of history, own sense of their past, etc. Um, and it's get it's brought into this this settler state. Uh, so in this case, the secular was used to both erase or tame Muslim histories of Kashmir. It's not that they erased it altogether. In some sense, they did. But then it was also, you know, Islam just kind of became this, um, you know, very kind of Sufi, uh, or at least this is the um, the rendition that the Indian government was trying to have, that it was apolitical. It didn't really have any kind of liberatory power beyond just an identity that was tamed by Hinduism in Kashmir. So in addition to that, I also show how um, Hindu geographies, imaginaries, and histories were central to these secular discourses. Um, and that also reveals the close relationship between secularism, settler colonialism, and Hindu majoritarianism. And then finally, I draw from interventions in critical secularism studies to show that secular power actually isn't really about just the separation between religion and the state, um, but it also defines or determines what exactly religion is. Um, and it actually exacerbates religious tensions um, because of the ways in which it regulates uh, religious life. So uh, Drabli was the Amir of the Jamaat Islami in Kashmir. And of course, um, the Jamaat explicitly critiqued the purported secularism of both the Indian state, but also the Kashmir state. And in 1955, GM Sadiq, who was the left-leaning minister of education under Bakshi, um, also known as one of the main kind of communists in the Bakshi bureaucracy, he put out this new education policy for, for the government. And uh, the Jamaat, organized a series of symposiums about this or in response to this education policy. And in one of the articles about this policy, he basically criticizes the government's um, uh, policy on very ideological grounds. And in many ways, when you think about it now, he would he leverages what we would now call a decolonial critique. Um, so he criticized the adoption of Western educational norms and philosophies he argued that even as the Western world had advanced technologically and obtained a position of leadership, it had, and I'm quoting him now, it had divided the human community <clears throat> and provided a basis for a bloodbath on which man has twice played the holy of human blood on a large scale. 
Um, and this is in reference to the two world wars, which had obviously just happened. Um, he said that Western education erected walls um, and that nationalism in particular basically kind of created these divides between men um, and taught them to annihilate each other. And another kind of really interesting imagery that he uses to talk about Western education is that he describes it as a, or he compares it to a garden. He says that its poisonous fruit is so sharp and bitter that neither the shade of the trees nor the spring of the garden can withstand this bitterness. The death of the fruit has turned the whole beauty of the garden upside down. Um, and then he says, you know, going on with this uh, garden metaphor, he says that completely like new garden or new plants have to be planted in this garden. So even though Drabli doesn't use the term secularism, um, it's evident that the form of Western education, which is seeped in secular values that remove morality um, or kind of a religiously or theologically informed morality from the curriculum is to be blamed for this bloodbath. And the Kashmir government was basically drawing from Western norms of education in terms of um, seeing the purpose of education as being about ec the economy, kind of building this economic uh, body um, of the citizenry and also technological advancement, um, instead of what he argues is cultivating kind of a sense of morality and a purpose beyond um, beyond this this world, right? And so leveraging his critique on civilizational terms, he actually goes beyond just the expected criticism that Islam or Muslim, you know, something about Islam should be included in the curriculum. Um, he just actually critiques the foundation of the curriculum and what it's all about altogether. And so what's interesting, I think, about this is that um, when you think about decolonial thinking, it's often reserved, or you imagine, many people imagine that it's these leftist anti-colonial thinkers who are doing that kind of work. Um, but here we have a leftist communist education minister, Sadiq, who's actually enabling colonization in Kashmir. And then you have an Islamist who is very much engaging in this actual decolonial thinking um, and kind of getting to the roots, epistemological roots of uh, Western civilization and why it's so problematic. So it kind of ties to this um, next question that I want to ask you. Again, you have a whole chapter on this about the patronage of Kashmiri culture and its institutionalization. And we've spoken about this before and I would kind of, kind of like to ground the question in this incident and maybe you could elaborate on it. So recently when this whole G20 thing was happening in uh, Kashmir, uh, there was this meeting in Kashmir and the guests were coming and they were on the airport and there were people who were there to greet them. And so some of the people, uh, some of them even with you know well intentions, uh, criticized the government for misrepresenting Kashmiri culture when these guests were being welcomed. Uh, so their locus of critique was that, you know, this dress that the people who are welcoming them, the girls who are welcoming them is not, you know, doesn't represent Kashmiri culture or this song is not Kashmiri or that symbol is not Kashmiri or this, you know, way of greeting guests is not Kashmiri. So the point was that there was a misrepresentation of what was uh, Kashmiri culture. And we have seen this in the past as well, where calls have been made appeals have been made to the state to preserve um, Kashmiri culture, to preserve Kashmiri language, and all of these different things, where we see this objectification of culture, so to speak, which has to be protected. And obviously, resistance is not seen as part of uh, this culture. So it's, it's a, it's a museum-like culture that has to be kind of preserved. It's not, you know, people's everyday life and what characterizes it, that does not kind of become part of the culture. So, so tell us about how India constructed a Kashmiri culture um, that was domesticated and that made no claims that challenged India's colonial uh, sovereignty over Kashmir. Um, so you have mentioned Jashni Kashmir and similar programs and events in your uh, chapter. So the depoliticization of the Kashmiri subject through this culture talk, tell us about that. 
Yeah, so, I mean, if there's one thing I hope people get away with uh, after reading the book is that India's colonialism really operated through these inclusive, assimilationist, integrationist strategies in this time. And India liked to claim itself, and it still does, uh, as a nation that is all about unity and diversity. So cultural diversity itself doesn't really threaten the Indian nation state. In fact, it's used uh, Kashmir's cultural distinctiveness for its own ends. Um, both the Kashmir and the Indian government did not see the type of Kashmiri cultural nationalism um, emerging as subversive, but they rather promote being in tandem with Indian nationalism. So Jashne Kashmir is an example of this, where this was an annual festival. Um, and it was intended to bring to light, as they thought, many aspects of Kashmiri culture and, quote, serve as a vehicle of contact between Kashmir and the rest of India. And so there would be theater shows, music, poetry, dance, sports, um, and other events from Kashmir, but also Indian states. And thousands of people would come from India. And of course, people in Kashmir would also attend these um, festivals. Mm -hmm. And in addition to Jashna Kashmir, there was also the creation of cultural institutions like the Cultural Academy, which still exists today, and the development of Radio Kashmir. Um, and so through these institutions, the government was basically able to bring a vast amount of cultural production within its fold. And so part of my argument is that it bureaucratized Kashmir's emerging cultural intelligentsia. It provided with them with the resources and the platforms to show their work. Um, and it also sent its officers to various parts of the state to collect poems or literature or folk tradition that, quote, represented Kashmiri culture. And so in many ways, it also institutionalized then what would have otherwise just been a part of like folk or oral tradition. Um, but the issue with this, of course, is that the government was quite selective in terms of what constituted Kashmiri culture and how it was to be depicted. And it was born out of a par the particular political needs of the moment, in particular to promote uh, the secular culture, um, which was used to justify India's links with Kashmir. And then, of course, the question then arises, what is erased in this canonization? Um, and what I think is interesting about this is that um, later on, Kashmiri cultural nationalism was a contested terrain for advocates of self-determination because of its appropriation and use by the Kashmir government. Um, and I think that's also possibly why the Kashmir Tehreek isn't necessarily reliant on these cultural markers as other struggles may be. So, for example, yeah. there isn't necessarily an emphasis on Kashmiri music or culture or language or dress or other forms of cultural nationalism, given that they were appropriated and used by the Kashmir and the Indian government. And some may bemoan this, but I actually think it's one of the Tariq's most salient characteristics that it actually has asserted itself through more universal like values of the quest for freedom, justice and liberation, rather than uh, relying on these cultural markers. Yeah, there's actually um, a very, very good point that you made towards the end of the, in the sense that uh, this is something that I've also noticed where um, so it's also kind of forces you to rethink what we take culture to be. Um, um, it's not just, I would say that, you know, one of the things that it tells you is that if you really think about culture as what grounds people, and what people feel that they belong to and what characterizes people's habitus, so to speak, then Azadi and, and the quest for it and the whole vocabulary around it and anyone who lives in Kashmir has been part of Tehreek um, knows that there's a whole vocabulary around it. There are jokes around it. Um, there are idioms around it. Um, and it's a culture on its own. So I really feel that it doesn't just tell us that, you know, people have not concerned themselves with um, these artifacts of culture, so to speak, is because there is a living culture that they are a part of. Uh, that is deeply Kashmiri, which is the struggle for liberation. And therefore, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the, the objects, um, Ferran, for example, or, you know, um, all of these different things, they're not threatened, so to speak, because India, and then you kind of 
ties to the broader question of uh, this particular nation state you're dealing with and its singularity in the sense that its model of imperialism or colonialism has been one which you pointed out has been one of unity within diversity so a diversity within unity i don't know i got it wrong mixed mm-hmm. up so whatever it is the point is that it has kind of accommodated difference and allowed difference and it has kind of defined itself through difference so it would make no sense uh, for it to feel threatened by difference uh, until and unless obviously that difference translates into questioning the sovereign claims of the state itself so the difference has always been domesticated rather it's been one of the legitimating stories that the indian nation state tells us about itself so that's why you know the resistance has not really invested itself into all of these questions um rather it has been more universal in how it has narrated its uh, struggle and has always seen the struggle not as exceptional but has tied it to other struggles that are happening or have happened in the past or other the struggle many a times is narrated in transcendental terms where the struggle is you know everlasting so so that is very interesting about the kashmiri freedom struggle and that brings us to the end of our podcast today Thank you so much Dr. Hafsa for joining us in this conversation and thanks to everybody who listened. We have a few more podcasts coming for you in the following weeks on topics such as demystifying the myth of Pandit Exodus, towards an Islamic liberation philosophy, history of anti-colonial rebellions led by the Sufis and the failure of non-violence. Thank you so much for tuning in.